All right, let's, uh, let's start the slides then. So this is actually an, a, an amended version of what we do at the, the Octo Project Dev Day, uh, something that we're doing tomorrow off-site, but otherwise uh, we're, we're going to be talking today primarily about BitBake and how that works. Uh, now this presentation is available on the CM website, but because it's a, it's a version of the Octo Project Dev Day, we actually distribute that as part of a Google Doc. Uh, and in fact, this was originally a Google Doc. In fact, we've given you the, uh, the Google Doc Live uh, shortened URL here. So theoretically, in those cases, we always just get people to follow along on the website. You actually have the PDF for this uh, from the CM website. So you can do it either way. So let's talk first about all the different terms that are here. And the reality is, is that so there's an awful lot of, of, of naming and other kinds of things that, that are uh, important. And it's worth understanding what those, those names are. And the reason is, is because when you're asking questions or talking to one of the developers, quite often it's important to be specific in, in, into what you're talking about and how these things work. Now, strictly speaking, most people know what you're talking about. But if you don't know the exact naming of things, sometimes what happens is when you ask questions on the mailing list or what have you, somebody will correct your what you call things as opposed to answering your question. So it's quite good to understand exactly where the boundaries are in order to make things happen. When you're on your own, you can mangle the names as much as you want. But publicly, it's best to use the proper names. So let's talk about what all these things mean. The first thing is Yocto Project. Now, Yocto Project is something that uh, is pr largely uh, a project. That it is run by the, the, the Linux Foundation. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, there's a number of member companies all, all uh, working on things together in order to build a single common build system that can be used by everyone across our, our, uh, our uh, industry. And when it comes to Yocto Project, the big thing it does over just straight up open embedded is it actually takes the software on a regular basis makes a release after stabilizing it, testing it, and so on. So instead of the rolling release that we get with Open Embedded, we actually get two releases six months apart uh, that come out and essentially support specific boards going forward. And so the nice thing about that is that when you're building products, instead of having a moving target to work on, you actually have a branch with fixes in it. So as security fixes and other things come in, you can just track that branch of the release you're using. Okay? Open Embedded, on the other hand, is an open source project. It's where the, a lot of the core technologies come from. It's where uh, we'll talk about the, the tools and metadata. Most of the tools and metadata for the Yocto project come from the Open Embedded project, which is an open source project. BitBake, the build tool. That's the thing that allows us to ultimately do all the things we're about to talk about. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Pocky, and it is Pocky. You'll, you'll see people pronouncing it Pokey as well as Pocky. Okay, Pocky is in fact what this is. Uh, uh, pronounce that if you go through through uh, a grocery store and look in the, the the Asian candy section you will find that there is a chocolate uh, stick that's spelled P-O-C-K-Y Pocky literally Pocky it is named after that candy all right Pokey Pokey is Gumby's horse okay so it's that big that big uh, green horse thing from from the okay not Pokey now, you will hear some developers call it Pokey. Quite honestly, they're trolling other people in the project, okay? It is, in fact, Pocky. All right? Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> it's a fun group of people to be in. So let's, uh, let's look at the Octo Project overall. And so the nice thing about this is, is, again, the idea with the Octo Project is to stabilize all these different code uh, repositories and actually make things work on, on several different off-the-shelf boards and so on. Uh, it's important that we have this, or otherwise we can't build all the things that we need to. Out of the box, uh, as much as Linux and, uh, and other uh, code bases we're using support more than just these architectures, Yocto Project concentrates on the member, member company uh, architectures. So specifically, x86, ARM, MIPS, and PowerPC. Now, they do those four, but also the 64-bit versions. So both 32 and 64-bit are supported. Strictly speaking, that's eight architectures, if you want to look at it that way. All right. Uh, next, you'll see, of course, it, it's saying it's, uh, it's based on the Open Embedded Project. Uh, again, that is the major technology that's under there. Uh, the big thing, however, when Yocto Project came along, uh, the, the big change that happened to Open Embedded was the introduction of the concept of what's called a layer. 
Uh, layer, layering and, and uh, the layer system is in fact, in my opinion, the killer feature that, uh, that Yocto Project brings to the table. It allows you to stratif stratify and modularize your design in such a way that moving forward, you don't have to figure out what you did to the old thing to move forward to a new version. All right, so it, it's a very good way of, of mixing and matching and coming up with a dry design, okay? Uh, those, anybody who's done web design probably knows what dry stands for. Uh, do not repeat yourself. So the idea is to do things in such a way that your maintenance is done in a single way uh, and once, right? Uh, the opposite of dry is, of course, wet. Okay, write everything twice, all right? Or, or thrice, depending on who you are. So the whole idea is you want to not copy and, and then have to maintain multiple things, right? That, that basically, you, you lose engineering resources over that. The idea is to share as much of the load as you can with other people, uh, choose designs and, and ways of doing things so that your workload is lower, right? So that you can actually share it with others and make things work. And that could be at your company or that could be across the industry, depending on how you do it. So Open Embedded itself, uh, if, you go to the, uh, if you go to the Git repository for Open Embedded, you'll actually see that we have a, an awful lot of different kinds of recipes that are available. This is actually the meta directory we're looking at here. Uh, we have on the order of a thousand different recipes in those particular kinds of areas. A recipe is a, a file that essentially tells you how to go from source code to a working package that can be installed on a image. All right, so you'll find there's a lot of food themed things here, recipe, right, Bitbake. Uh, the, the, the core of Bitbake is actually called Cooker. In the past we had a, a tool called Hob. A hob is, a, uh, is, a, is an oven essentially. Um, we have things like toaster, there's a lot of food related kinds of things. All right, so Bitbake is the first piece. Now, Bitbake's kind of interesting because it was actually something that, that came out of some other projects uh, op uh, out of uh, Open Hand, which uh, originally worked on things like the Zorus, and, and uh, or, or rather the technology came from the Zorus and other things like that. It's, uh, it's written in Python, and in fact, more than that, when you are writing uh, recipes and metadata, your code is in fact running within the Python interpreter. So in fact, if you know Python, a lot of the syntax and what you're dealing with is the same. In fact, what Bitbake is, is, is it is a augmentation of the Python interpreter. So in fact, you were they've actually modified how Python works. But you'll find that in a lot of situations, just straight up Python does, does what you expect. All right? Uh, metadata, of course, almost everything in, in Open Embedded and therefore Yocto is metadata. Uh, metadata, of course, is telling you things about the data itself. Uh, again, it's largely build recipes on how to go from, again, source code out on the internet to uh, packages that you can actually uh, do something with. Now, Pocky, the reference distribution, uh, I probably didn't explain that well enough before, but Pocky uh, is essentially a, a, w a way of using Open Embedded uh, in order to make things uh, happen. And the reason is, is because metadata is nothing without configuration. And so without having a default set of configuration or a, a specific way of looking at the world to start things off, uh, there's no easy way of testing it. So Pocky is essentially a particular set of uh, horizontal decisions, okay, horizontal as opposed to vertical, in the sense that you are making the same decisions across the entire system. So whenever we talk about policy, okay, we're talking about distribution policy. This isn't a matter of how to distribute it to other people. This is distribution in the Linux distribution sense. Right? What, do we, what, is, uh, what is the naming? What is the packaging scheme we're using? Right? What, what branding do we have? Those kinds of things. All right. So Pocky gives you a, a starting point. Uh, it is not the only thing you must use. In fact, Pocky is one of those things where uh, it gives you an example of how to use it. You then use it to make your own distribution for your particular company or what you're doing. You could use it. Many people do. But usually you have your own decisions that you want to make. And as soon as you start to stray from what's in Pocky, of course, uh, you essentially have your own uh, mechanism. So what does Pocky contain? It contains a version of Bitbake that works with the, the, uh, the released version, the, the uh, tested released version of, of, of Open Embedded that's included with Yocto project. We get a number of build scripts beyond what's in Open Embedded. Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, of, of packages that are, and metadata that are shared between Open Embedded and Yocto project in a layer called uh, Meta. This is the, what's called the OE core or open embedded core files. 
These are maintained, co-maintained by the Octo project and Open Embedded. Uh, we also have uh, MetaPocky. Uh, this is a layer that just has information about the distribution and, and, and nothing else at this point. Uh, if you look at older versions of Yocto project, you'll find this was called Meta Yocto. Okay, and that's because it was the layer that made uh, the meta layer into, you know, the specific things for Yocto project. However, so much was moved down into the meta layer that what was left in that layer was merely Pocky configuration. And so we now have Meta Pocky instead of Meta Yocto. We also have another layer uh, that gives us BSPs, reference BSPs for the four reference platforms we use in order to test Yocto project. Uh, those BSPs are, are for the, uh, let's see now here, there's uh, largely the Minnow board or any Atom based uh, system. Uh, for ARM, we use the BeagleBone Black at the moment, uh, or realistically any Beagle board, but that's the main one that gets used. Uh, for PowerPC, there is a, uh, uh, I believe, a motor, not a Motorola, an FSL board, uh, although uh, Freescale having been bought, I suppose now it's, it's uh, what is it, NXP now? Uh, I believe it's still an FSL board from a branding perspective, but I'm sure that will change. Uh, let's see now here, what, what's left? ARM, oh, MIPS. In the case of MIPS, uh, there's actually a, a uh, product from uh, Ubiquity. Uh, their edge router is in fact a nice little 64-bit dual core MIPS platform. Uh, it's about 100 bucks, and uh, the nice thing is, is that it, uh, you can take the USB key out from inside, although by doing that you void your warranty. Uh, but you can put whatever you want on there, and it's it's just a really nice little MIPS development platform, so it works really well. So those four uh, BSPs are there so that you can actually do your thing. You'll actually find there's five or six. Uh, again, there's 64 and 32-bit versions of a number of these, these reference uh, BSPs. However, the big thing that Pocky brings to the table because of the Yocto project is documentation. And in fact, the fellow who writes the documentation is here at this conference uh, this week, and uh, he, make, he actually lives not far from here. He makes sure that, in fact, th that we actually have documentation. As many of you probably know, open source projects in general suffer uh, generally from poor documentation, uh, largely because a lot of the work is being done by volunteers. And as programmers, what do we want to write? Code or documentation? Code, right? And so that's essentially how that works. And so uh, ha by having a, a paid technical writer do stuff, it means we actually have some really good documentation. Was, do you have a question? Yeah, so here's the mic. Let's just make sure it turns. There we go, it turns on. I just have a simple question. Uh, how old is the Yocto project? How old is the Yocto project? Oh dear. Uh, I, is there like many changes? So it's seven, seven years, is it? I think it's seven or eight years old now. So it's been around for a long time. Open Embedded has been around for, I think, almost 14 years. The Yocto project's been around, uh, is younger than that. Uh, but in the last, again, it's seven or eight years. I don't remember the exact day. I was actually there when they announced it publicly as opposed to, uh, the, the, the second announcement about Yocto project was actually at this conference uh, years ago. And I don't remember exactly which one it was, but it was something like, you know, seven, seven-ish years ago. So, but we're now at the point where Yocto project is, is uh, not being used by everyone, but it has become the de facto standard for an awful lot of our industry. Yeah. It seems like it's coming heavily <laughs> among those people who is coding. Yeah, no, it's 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 uh, it's essentially the way that people are doing it these days. So, yeah. Put that there. Okay, so let's keep going here. So this is in fact the uh, the, the picture you will actually see in all the documentation and on the website. Uh, this gives you an idea of the flow of data that's happening in here. And if you look at the very top, you have things that are in yellow. This is where your source code comes in from. We then have source mirrors under it, as well as uh, configuration off to the left. So the orange things here are things that you provide, potentially. Uh, the blue things are BitBake itself. You'll see we have our package feeds and our outputs down here in purple. Let's go through all those things, okay? So the first thing is you'll see that we have these yellow places where source code comes from. So every one of our recipes specifies some source of, of uh, source code. It could be a Git repository, a website with a tarball, it could be a local file, uh, it could be a, a something inside or outside of your firewall for, for proprietary stuff, whatever you want. Uh, essentially, if there is source code somewhere and you can get to it from your computer using some protocol, there's probably a fetcher for it, all right? It doesn't really matter which, which uh, source code repository 
system you use, somebody's written a fetcher for it. It's, it's that good. Uh, clear case support isn't directly in Open Embedded, but I'm, I, I'm told that there is, in fact, a fetcher available if you look for it. But Perforce, uh, you know, CVS, Subversion, uh, pretty much name something, Darks, there is, a, there is support for it. Realistically speaking, though, most of the software we use is usually in Git, and there's a few people still using Subversion, but realistically, almost everything is Git these days, or a tarball from somewhere. Anyway, the problem with getting source code externally, however, is, of course, websites go down, people take their, their websites offline, there are issues, and so one of the things that we also have is a series of source mirrors. What a source mirror is, is it's a, a secondary place to get source code from. As much as we want to get it from the upstream source, there are situations where that doesn't work. By having a source mirror, uh, in fact, you have a backup place to get that source code from. And if you're using Pocky, the source mirror that comes as a part of that distribution is, in fact, run by the Yocto projects. And they maintain copies of tarballs and source code for a good number of years. If you want to maintain your own source, mirrors, there's a, a way in your configuration to specify where you want those to be. Uh, normally, you'd want to put that somewhere that you control, so usually within your corporation or what have you. Now, there's in fact something that's not on this slide that we also have available, and that is something called a pre-mirror. A pre-mirror is just like a mirror, but we check it first before we go out to the internet. This is very good if you, for instance, have a software auditing mechanism, or you work in a team uh, across uh, across a connection to the internet and you don't want you know 100 people all pulling the same file down. So by having a pre-mirror you can essentially have people get the source code locally as opposed to having to go out to the internet all the time. So there's lots of different support for getting things from source code. We also have our other inputs down the side and again all of our inputs are in yellow or, or orange. We have our user configuration, our metadata, our machine BSP configuration, our policy configuration. Now there's a couple of different ways of, of naming these things. So just bear in mind that there's different names that you have to understand how these things work. Let's start at the bottom. When it says policy configuration, this is your distribution information. Okay, so this is your distro.conf uh, file effectively, whatever that happens to be. In our case, we're using uh, Pocky Tiny, so it'll be PockyTiny.conf. But this is where we make our horizontal decisions, branding, package, packaging, and other kinds of things like that. Uh, we can override that elsewhere. Uh, we also have what's called the machine BSP configuration. This is also called your machine.conf file. Uh, this is the thing that tells you about your board. All right. So what's the architecture of the CPU? What hardware is being used? You know, what 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 device tree are we going to be using with with the thing? What's the the format of the the kernel? What what bootloader are we using? That sort of thing. Okay. So that's the next level up. Up next up, we have our metadata. This is where we have access to all of our BB files, all of our, our BitBake files. Uh, there's a number of different recipe formats or uh, files and extensions we have to talk about, but essentially uh, those plus patches give us our metadata. Most of this comes from the Open Embedded project, but of course you can write your own as well. And then finally we have our user configuration. This is all the .conf files that you control, most notably things like BB layers, local.conf, site.conf, things we will talk about in future slides. But these are things that are, look, that are specific to you as developers, as opposed to things that are checked into, into uh, source code repositories. So now we have all the different tasks that happen with inside BitBake. And you'll see that, well, those of you who have done this before will notice that there's a few missing. We've, this is always what we show because it's just a little bit shorter. But the first thing we have is the source fetcher. This is the thing that gets our source code based on our inputs to the side here. Once we get the source code, quite often we have a couple of things we have to do. If it's a tarball, we have to unpack, all right? If it's a, uh, a uh, repository, we might have to check out something. Uh, but the point is, is that we get the source code out into a directory we can then deal with. We then have a situation where we might have some patches we have to apply. Now, patches are kind of an odd idea in open source projects. Why weren't they upstreamed? And the answer is, is that there's quite often things you have to do locally that perhaps can't be upstreamed. Uh, perhaps from a, a speed perspective, you've got a security update that you really need to use before you can upstream it. Uh, perhaps there's some paths that change based on what it is you're building specifically. So you have your own way of installing things or what have you, so there's a few things there. Uh, maybe the, um, the, the policies that you have set up for your project beyond this policy configuration, but your company's policies require you to do certain things, in which case you might have to add patches. Some of these patches just cannot be upstreamed. 
okay? Uh, and in other cases, it's because the, the, the upstream maintainer doesn't want what it is you're trying to do. So the whole point is that you may, in fact, have some patches there. Try not to, but if you have patches that are required, uh, that's what happens. And even, even Debian has their own packages, uh, so their own patches, rather, in order to make their packages work properly on a Debian system, for instance. So that's where our patches get applied. We then have several steps here that everyone's familiar with. Configuration, right? Compilation, uh, installation, and all that sort of thing. Uh, so we have a configuration step, such that if you're using something like autocomp for or CMake, or what have you, that gets run. Another task that does our compile, another task that does installation. Uh, those files are installed temporarily into a staging directory. The staging directory then, in fact, will look at the files that have been output, and then based on a series of rules, will then make it into a series of packages. Now, in this case, we're talking literal packages, either RPMs, deb packages, or IPK packages, depending on what has been chosen but you'll see that we have all three listed here. Uh, the default for open embedded is IPackage, which is a embedded derivative of the Debian format. Uh, of course, we've got RPMs here, which is the, the default of the Yocto project uh, and, and Pocky. And then in fact, we have, uh, you can do straight up deb files if you really want to uh, as well at the, at the top there. Now, just because we're using packages doesn't mean we necessarily have a package manager on the target. That's a separate decision. But by making things into packages first, before we make our image, we have our, uh, our uh, smart tarballs that effectively now understand the thing that you, you want to depend on when you build your, your target, which is important. All right, but before we go into the package feed, in this case, this is your repo, your yum repo or your, uh, your Debian repo, uh, we go through a series of QA tests. Now, these are not QA tests necessarily that your QA people will be writing. These are QA tests to make sure that silly things haven't happened uh, in your, your system. They will check things like your readme file isn't, isn't a template that hasn't been filled in. They'll make sure that, that uh, uh, files aren't in the wrong place, right? If you've got a, a binary in the man, man page directory, for instance, or, uh, or that your license is in the wrong place or something. So it, it, there's a number of common mistakes that we'll check for to make sure that your packages uh, you don't find out that the mistakes are in the field, or you don't make, find your mistakes later on. It tries to point those mistakes out very early. Okay, uh, one, one more thing here. After that happens, it gets copied over to the package feeds, and then we get on to the next stage. But before we do that, we've got a question. All right, here you go. So um, is Yocto sort of like uh, Ross or something like Oh, uh, no. So, so ROS is something that runs on top of uh, another operating system. Uh, Yocto Project literally builds the entire operating system from scratch. So it will build everything from your uh, compiler originally, your kernel, the bootloader, the root file system. It, like build root, it builds everything. Okay, whereas ROS is merely a, con a component of what ultimately you're building. This is a full-on operating system that we're building. This, this is building everything from source from scratch. Does that, does that help? Okay. Baking from scratch, yeah, for, for, with, with full-on recipes. So we now have our package feeds. What, what do we need out of the system to make something work properly? Yocto Project and Open Embedded, the thing to understand is it is not a, devel a development system. We are, not, we are not replacing make here. We are, we are building an image for a target. Okay? We are building an image for a, a micro SD card, an EMMC device, uh, some sort of boot media. All right. So developing within Yocto Project is not very straightforward. You can do it, and you'll see a lot of people complaining that it's hard or it doesn't work the way they expect. It's not intended for development, okay? It's an image builder. So we need to build images. So here's our package feeds off to the side. When we build an image recipe, in fact, it will take those packages, it will then generate an image and put it into the images directory. And this is ultimately what we can then put on our media. Now, to develop on top of that, of course, it would be very nice to have what we get more traditionally from a, a, uh, a vendor BSP, and that is we need things like the compiler that was used, we need to have the libraries, include files, and all the other bits so we can put software on top of what we built as far as the image is concerned. This was done originally because Open Embedded was used by a number of consultants and various companies that embedded Linux vendors to make things for their, their, uh, their clients, much like proprietary systems. And so having an SDK would allow you to then put your applications on top of the system. Again, 
All those things come from the, from the, uh, the packages that we built. And so again, parallel to image creation, we can create a series of cross tools, cross libraries, cross uh, uh, you know, header files and so on. So people can then build images and, and applications that run on top of it. What we've missed out of this is that we now have something called the ESDK. The ESDK coupled with a tool called DevTool, which uh, hopefully we're talking about this afternoon, in fact, can be used for doing development on top of this system. So straight, straight up BitBake, the stuff we're talking about this morning, uh, very hard to do development under. As soon as you start getting into DevTool and the, the, the extensible SDK, in fact, there is a way of, a supported way of doing uh, development on top of that. Oh, that gets a little bit beyond the scope of this specific course this morning. Anyway, the neat thing is, is that we have a series of images and SDKs that are built from the same packages, all built the same way. And this is the important bit. Okay? Uh, one other thing that's uh, exciting, and again, beyond the scope of this specific course, but uh, we also, in our, our uh, Linux Foundation course, teach uh, the, uh, the Eclipse graphical interface for those of you who like using IDEs. Uh, setting that up is rather tricky. However, the idea that we've actually come up with over time uh, that they're trying to do now is they're actually trying to make it so we can build the IDE using the same mechanism. So in fact, we can configure not only an SDK, but get a configured version of Eclipse out of that build. So that's, that's coming, that's not yet, that won't be in Sumo or anything, but uh, we're trying to get to a point where we can use the same build system because it's a pretty impressive build system to, to output graphical tools as well. Okay, so let's talk about BitBake. That's really the core of what we're dealing with. Uh, the big thing here is to understand the, the input to BitBake, and the input is something called a recipe. Now, there's a number of things that are either recipes or recipe fragments, uh, but anything that ends in .bb, bb standing for BitBake, uh, is in fact metadata. And the, th the, th the thing to understand, of course, is exactly what was just said. It, it is, in fact, baking from scratch. Here are the ingredients you need. Here's the source code. Uh, here are the commands you need to run, and so on. Okay. Now, the cool thing is, is that we can actually do a lot of this very, uh, in a very automated fashion because many things are quite straightforward. Things like auto-tooled uh, source code. We all know you untar, you dot slash configure, you make, you make install. Though in those situations, it's very straightforward. Even in a make situation, it's almost always just make and then make install. So there's a number of things where it's very, very straightforward. We will see some examples of some, some uh, recipes like that a little bit later. But the thing to understand is that we have a series of pieces of metada uh, metadata that have uh, dependencies and such on each other. BitBake will take those and build them in the correct order so things ultimately happen. Let's check on our, oh no, we know our build's finished, that's right. Okay, so there are four specific metadata files that we, uh, we're gonna talk about next. The first is the BB files, and again, these are the, just the straight up recipes. However, uh, we also have a situation where we have special, different kinds of special recipes. One of them is called a, a package group. And what a package group is, is it's a recipe that depends on other recipes. Okay? The reason we have this is so we have a way of installing a group of packages with a single name. And the reason we do this is for dry reasons again. Right? If you have several different images that depend on the same group of packages, would you rather list all the packages in each one of the images or just one package that depends on all the other bits you need? Okay, so a package group is a way of essentially making it so you can add something to the package group and then anybody who needs that list of packages just uses the name of the package group. Okay, so anybody who's done any Debian work, they call them meta packages. Okay, they don't actually install anything, they just drag in a bunch of other things through dependencies. All right. It's worth noting that everything in Open Embedded and Yocto Project is done by what's called convention. The reason why we don't call them rules is because if you actually look at how BitBake is put together, you can literally change any of the things I'm telling you. So any rules I tell you can be broken, all right? And this is because you can extend not only recipes, but also BitBake itself within a recipe. So you can actually change whatever's going on. You'll find out that whenever there's a rule as to the order things are, are executed in, in fact, there's a way of of subverting that and making it do something else. So there's always an override mechanism of some, de some degree, all right? So by convention, we call package groups, always have the word package group in it. They start with package group dash something, all right? Do they have to be called package groups? No, okay? The thing to remember is this. In fact, let's use an example. All of you write code, yes? 
all of you write code and then you come back two, three years from now and you go back and you look at your code, do you immediately understand it? it takes some time, right? In fact, I'm sure some of you have got to the point where you go back and you look at some code and you look at it and you go, which idiot wrote this code? And then you go and you look at the source code log and you realize, in fact, you're that idiot. <laughs> okay? The thing to remember is that recipes are ultimately communication channels. You are communicating with two groups of people. Well, a person and a group of people. You're communicating with your colleagues and you're communicating with yourself in the future. So the clearer you can make it, essentially the, the closer you can make it to the convention, in other words, the closer you can make it so you don't have to think about what it means, the better. Okay? Why do you, co you collaborate with your colleagues? Well, amongst other things, it's so they don't have to come and ask you questions, so you can get on with your coding. Right? If you can document what you're doing through code in an efficient fashion, you get to do more of what you want to do. Okay? That's, that's, that's the selfish reason. Of course, there's also the, you're trying to be nice and what have you, but, but more than anything else, you're trying to make sure that they can do their job, you can do your job. However, also communicating with yourself in the future, of course, means that you can get back and keep doing your thing really fast. If you have to start over again or figure it out on your own, that's kind of annoying. So try to stick to convention as much as you possibly can. The next one is BB class. If it ends in dot, dot BB class, uh, this is in fact uh, a bit like a, a pure virtual fun, uh, object. If you think of C++ or uh, Python or, or any of the other object-oriented languages, we have the idea of a class and an instance. Think of a BB class as being essentially the, the parent class of what you're doing. All right? So it's, it's the kind of thing that happens over and over again as you're building a recipe. Uh, well, it looks like a, uh, an auto-tooled thing, therefore we're going to inherit from the, the auto-tooled BB class. We don't have to write that code again. All right? So it's an inheritance kind of, of situation. We also have configuration. Now, strictly speaking, uh, these aren't recipes. However, they are still metadata. Uh, but they're metadata that live in specific places. Recipes and package groups live in the recipes directories. BB classes live specifically in directories called classes. So when we, look, when we look at layers later, there's a classes directory. All BB classes must be in there. It's a part of the, uh, the search path. Uh, and in fact, configuration files always live in a directory called conf. All right? and we actually have two conf directories. What's called the top level conf directory, which is effectively your build configuration directory. And then per layer, we have a conf directory uh, that configures the layer that you're in. And again, we'll, we should see some examples of that later. But again, all configuration files end in .conf. How do we know it's configuration file? Because it ends in that ending. Okay? Must it end that way? No. But you're going to you're gonna have to make it a lot harder on yourself if you don't. We also have two other things. These are not strictly standalone files. These are used by other recipes, primarily, again, for dry reasons. Uh, the first one is BB Append. Uh, since we have layers, the nice thing about being able to change anything is that you can actually modify what's in a different layer by essentially providing a file that is inherently appended to that file at runtime. So let's say in the base we provide a foo.bb. Okay? Now, in other systems, you'd go and you'd edit that file directly. But in Yocto Project and Open Embedded with layers, we don't want to edit that file because then, then you diverge from upstream. Instead, in your layer, you create a file that ends in .bb append but has the same name, so foo.bb append. And as you build foo, it will automatically append that file to the recipe, and it means any changes that you make will override the ones that happened prior to that. So it means the neat thing is you can extend somebody else's work without actually changing it, which is very powerful because it means, in fact, depending on the layers that you put in there, you can actually build things different ways using the same base recipe. Okay? And what that means is you're not repeating yourself, which is very important from a main maintenance perspective. We also have include files. Include files feel the same way as, as uh, BB append or, or inherits, but the idea with an include file is it's very free form. Think of it like a header file. All right? The whole idea is that you can include an ink file from wherever you are. The neat thing about ink files, though, is that they can actually live in the, the subdirectories of, of, uh, of, of uh, under recipes, we have what are called package directories. Under that, we have named directories based on things like version and re revision and so on. Uh, the include files are actually looked through uh, based on a path. And in fact, you can involve, or rather uh, provide, more than one version of the include file. And based on other metadata, it will pull in one or, or the other. 
So the neat thing, again, is you can share include files between different versions of the same recipe. Uh, you can also be in a situation where you have uh, more than one kind of package recipe that actually uh, in, uh, includes from the same piece of code otherwise. But it's not as structured as, say, a BB class, for instance. There's actually two ways of including a uh, include file or an ink file. Uh, one's actually literally include, the other one's inc uh, require. Just like in things like Perl and make files, uh, you can in fact, if you do an include and it doesn't find the file, you get a warning. If you require that file, in fact, it will fail if it does not find the file. So the neat thing about this is if it doesn't find the file, in the case of an include, maybe you just didn't provide it for that version, for instance. Okay, whereas a different version might still use it. In the case of require, of course, it always must be there. So when it comes to OE core, and we, uh, we update these, uh, these numbers uh, every time a new version comes out, I've got a script that counts everything up. At the moment, in OE core proper, so just that one meta directory, we have uh, 88 BB files, 69 BB append files, 24 package groups, 188 BB classes, and these keep on going up over time, uh, 98 configuration files, and uh, 275 includes. Over time, these numbers have gone down, and many of these numbers have gone up. Why? Because through changing the, these things over time, they're making things more and more generic, which is very, very good. Okay? So you'll see that we have a number of different recipes directories in here. Not You can't easily see on this slide, but if you bring up the slides, you will be able to. So when it comes to using BitBake at the command line, once you are in the build directory, and to get into the build directory, there's a script you must run called OE build init env, and we'll uh, show, you, show you that in, in a, a demo a bit later on. But you'll say BitBake, and then you actually give the name of the recipe you want to build. Notice there's no path and there's no, there's no extension to it. This is actually the package name that you want built. And based on uh, a number of the pieces of metadata we'll look at later, it will go and look for a recipe called that. Presumably, it is in a subdirectory somewhere with a .bb at the end, but BitBake knows where to find them, and so it will go and find the appropriate recipe. If it says it can't find your recipe, it means that you've made a mistake in naming, or if you've, you've uh, created a new layer and put it in that layer, you've probably forgotten to add the layer to, the, to your build. Okay, so it's not, it, it's very likely something it's, uh, that you've done, perhaps a, a typo or what have you. Now, when it comes to doing this, by default, it will actually run what's called a task, and the, the default task is called build. So when you do a bit bake my recipe, by default, it runs build, build that will then do all the steps required in order to build and uh, uh, build your code, make a package, install it, and so on. However, you can run other tasks if you want. Uh, sadly, with BitBake, they're called commands, although in, in Open Embedded, we call them tasks. So when you want to run a specific task like clean, you do a BitBake minus C clean, and then specify the recipe that you want to run the clean task on. So a bit like a make clean, right, but for a specific recipe. We also have a clean all. This goes a little bit further. Clean essentially takes you back to a, uh, a fairly pristine state. Uh, clean all will take you not only back to a pristine state, but it'll also remove you from the, the, uh, the image directory you're, you, you are currently a part of and so on. So as you build an image, you get added to the root file system. So it'll actually pull you out of all those things. So there are situations where you need to do that. So this is a build only clean. This is a build and uh, image uh, root file system clean. Down here, you'll also see we have a list tasks. List tasks allows you to list all tasks that are actually currently available for that recipe because, of course, we can add our own tasks, and so we don't know all the ones that are available. Certain tasks are always available. Others, like I said, get added. So the next thing to understand is that BitBake, unlike uh, perhaps Make, uh, is, uh, is not strictly a build tool so much as it is a, a task scheduler. Uh, every build project is based, uh, or rather, um, broken down into a series of tasks, and in fact, it's important that certain tasks run before we can run the next thing. But Bitback, Bitbake rather is very hard, it's trying very hard in order to melt your CPU. It's trying very hard to keep the CPU running as fast as possible in order to make your image as quickly as it can. Uh, quite often you'll find on machines that, that don't have sufficient uh, cooling, in fact, that it'll, it'll actually overclock initially and then it'll go back to your max speed. In fact, it quite often will then derate down to about 80% uh, clock speed. And the reason is, is because it, it is using your CPUs 100% of the time. 
All right, so the better cooling you have, in fact, the faster your builds will be. You'll actually notice that your builds are actually using 100% of your CPU, and in some cases, 100% of your I.O. So just, just be, be aware of that. All right, so the way this works to make sure that it's using your CPUs as efficiently as possible, again, barring I.O. issues, is that every time it gets far enough along in building uh, one package that, that uh, another package has dependencies on, it will in fact start the next build as soon as it possibly can. So if you have a build dependency from one package to the other, do you need to have actually built the Debian package before, or the RPM package before you actually build the next thing? The answer is no. You, you merely have to have built enough of the dependent package and put it into the what's called the sysroot that, that the ne next package is going to be built against. So in other words, you end up getting builds that happen like this in parallel instead of sequentially. So they will build things as quick as they possibly can and in parallel as much as possible. As much as you'll see that we have up to eight different builds happening at once, in fact, each one of those will actually try to parallelize out to any CPUs that aren't being used with minus J uh, attached to the make file as well. So yeah, in this case, bitbake recipe is going to look for the recipe in, uh, in the variable called bitbake files, which is a, a bit of a path directory. Uh, of course, everything's broken down into tasks. The tasks have, have uh, dependencies on them, and again, it will do its best to, uh, to basically burn out your CPU. Uh, now, when it comes to choosing specific recipes, we have different ways of specifying uh, what, which recipe you want. It, you could just use the, the, the package name, but maybe you care about a specific version. Okay, and the way you do that is you actually ask for the version number. Uh, so the version is the version of the source code that you want built, and you have to have a specific recipe that supports that. But my recipe dash 1.0 ultimately says I want version 1.0 of my recipe, which would build the source code for 1.0 of whatever that's, that uh, source uh, package has to, happens to be. Now, there's another version that we have access to, and it's actually a revision. This is the revision of the metadata. This is the, the revision of what you've written. And it starts with an R, and it comes after the version. And so you'll see that you can specify not only the package name, not only the, the version, but actually also the revision as, as well at the end. Now, there's, there are situations where, again, usually when something's gone wrong, uh, or you want to specifically run something that you haven't properly plumbed in yet, you can actually specify uh, the actual file that you want pulled in. And so in this case, you'd have to provide minus B, and then the full path to the, the, the bitbake file that you want to, to uh, deal with. So in this case, you're saying run this specific file. Don't go through your search path. Don't, don't go and find things. I just want this. Okay? And again, strictly speaking, this is usually something you're doing for debugging. This is not what you do for real. You'd almost always run it in one of the top two ways. Okay? Now, the next thing, of course, is uh, building images. Now, the image that we did for you there, uh, depending on the machine you're using, is going to take a good long time. On a very big build server with lots of I.O. and lots of CPUs, uh, you can build it in 20, 30 minutes. Okay? That's with, without downloads. On my laptop, which is an i7 with 16 gigs of RAM, and uh, it's rather fast, uh, you'll actually find that the images that I build from scratch without having any, a, a download cache or shared state takes on the order of three to four hours. Right? It sort of depends on, I build a lot on, on uh, hotel Wi-Fi, so that doesn't help. Uh, but downloading things and then building it can take a good long time, easily hours. And so by having a machine that's very fast, this helps. However, we don't always have access to this. And quite frankly, it's boring staring at a build that's, that's running. Uh, so quite often, we start builds up and then go do other things, right? Maybe it's, on, maybe it's on our machine, but maybe we go for coffee, maybe we go for lunch, maybe we go home. Maybe we go home for the weekend, right? But the problem is this. Let's say you start off a build, and let's say it takes four hours. And let's say you run it overnight, so you don't have to sit there doing nothing. Uh, and you kick it off, and uh, the thing about BitBake is the first time it comes across a problem, it stops. Okay, that's a fairly reasonable thing to do. The problem with that, unfortunately, is if you just started up, kicked off a, a build, and you watched it for a second, and then gone home for the weekend, when you come in on Monday, it will be broken. Well, if it broke just after you left, you still have most of four hours to redo your build after you fix the thing, right? However, with, when it comes to the dependency tree, uh, quite often the, the uh, breakage is, 
is somewhere up in a, a part of the graph because the graph tends to grow out and then back again, right? It usually only impacts a part of your build. Usually the rest can keep going. So one of the options you can do is, is pass in a dash dash continue or if you're lazy minus K, right? And what this will do is this will continue as much as it possibly can. That one path will terminate, but it'll actually try to redirect those resources to do as much of the rest as possible. Usually what this means, again, depending where it's broken, is that you end up in a place where, you know, maybe three quarters, maybe more, you know, maybe 80% of it uh, is done. So maybe, maybe you're in a situation where a four hour build only has 45, 30 to 45 minutes left, okay? You get back to your desk, you fix the problem, you rerun the build, and it does that last bit as opposed to the four hours. So instead of losing your morning, you've, you've essentially take, taken to your coffee, your first coffee break to get to where you need to go. Okay, so when you're doing a really big build, especially for the first time, minus K is very useful. When you are debugging, you never use minus K because the problem is, is your errors will, will scroll off the screen. When you're debugging, you don't want minus K because you want it to stop and show you the error immediately in context. Okay, so this works out really well. Uh, now, essentially, if you just run it like this, of course, it will just, it will just uh, stop when, it's, uh, when it comes across the problem. So here, in fact, the, the default tasks that tend to run on a regular basis. And, oh, there's a question. Sorry, thank you very much. I missed that completely. Thank you, Scott. Um, will you go over, you said, you said BitBake uh, is not really, the whole Pocky environment is not really, you don't really use it for debugging, but you use something else. Can no, no about... BitBake is used for debugging. We don't use BitBake minus K for debugging. Okay. Yeah, we don't we don't run it we don't run continue when we're debugging because if if we do we don't see where we're, we're working on. If you run it without minus k, it will show you the error immediately. With minus k, it will try to work around the bug for now. Okay, I thought you made a statement earlier that said pocket. You don't typically use it for debugging. You use SDK, and then I, I wasn't sure. What development. That, development. Development. Okay. So so writing your own code under Yocto project is tricky, and it's not the original intention. The idea is to write code the way we've always written with a, a root file system and then just running your, your own make files or whatever outside of the actual build itself. Okay. So uh, running our development within the image builder all the time means you're doing a, a bunch of extra steps that aren't relevant for your development. Okay. Yeah, so the debugging is a different bit. And when we say debugging, we're talking about debugging the build, not debugging your code. Okay, so when the build is broken, we need to debug that. But when you're writing and debugging code for your application, let's say, that's entirely outside of Yocto project. Okay, so typically you do that first and then you figure out how to incorporate your code into packages for... Packaging is a separate step from development. Yeah, again, with the ESDK and with DevTool, they're trying to make that easier, but again, it, that wasn't the original intent of Yocto project was to do development of code. So the next thing, of course, is going over the various tasks. Again, we've, we've talked about these a little bit. Uh, again, fetch, unpack, patch, configure, compile, install. Uh, after install, we also do what's called a populate sysroot. This is the step where we're essentially taking what's necessary for other packages to be built against us, right, in a cross environment. And then finally, we have do package. This will take what's, what's in the do install directory, make packages, and put them into the package uh, repository. Okay, but what this means essentially is, is that we have to make sure that each one of these tasks where appropriate is made available. All right, you'll find that in most of our recipes we don't have to worry about them because they are, they are standardized and brought in. Now as you start building things, you'll in fact see uh, a, a uh, output that sort of tends to flash up and down depending on how fast your machine is. Uh, but uh, if you actually look in the, the, uh, the log file, in fact it will keep each one printed. You'll notice it'll tell you which task you're working out of a, a possible number of tasks. It will actually also tell you the, uh, the ID or the, the thread that's currently running it, the name of the recipe it's currently doing, and in fact, the task it is currently executing. So each task ends up being its own thing that happens in the cooker log, which is quite handy. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, tasks, they, the, 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 again, there's a convention. All task uh, uh, pieces of uh, what are called executable metadata start with the word do underscore. All right, so whenever you see do underscore, you know that it's the implementation of a task. So when you're doing the build, it's pretty straightforward to know what all those other things are, compile, configure, write, unpack, patch. These, these are things that we do ourselves. 
However, there's a few extra bits here that perhaps aren't as obvious. So package data. In the case of, of package data, here we're actually generating uh, uh, information that actually is going to be going into the actual package itself. So the description of, of how the, the RPM or DEB or I package is going to be built. The actual package step called do package, this, this actually creates the RPM or DEB or what have you and, and takes that information and your files and creates that file for you. Uh, write RPM actually takes this and puts it into the package feed. So once the package is built, it puts it into the repository. Uh, as far as populate license is concerned, there's a full license management system in the Yocto project and Open Embedded right now that will actually take your, uh, your license metadata and actually uh, cache it, uh, you know, uh, uh, ultimately put it into a manifest so you know what licenses are in your image and, and other things like that. So it parses through, does the checks, makes sure that the, the license is valid and does all that good stuff for you. And then finally, populate sysroot. Again, in this case, when it comes to cross-compiling, we have what's called a, a sysroot where we have all the cross-libraries, headers, uh, and perhaps other tools we need in order to build for the target on our host system. Okay, and that sysroot is what holds that information. All right, so here we're actually going to be doing, uh, showing you some examples here. Uh, when we build from the shared state cache, which is what we're doing in, in the example we, uh, we gave you, uh, essentially what happens is, is we start to get information from the shared state cache instead of doing things from scratch. And the reason we do this is from for a speed perspective. So that's kind of important because if you spend all your time doing things from scratch, you're wasting time. And because our builds take so long, there's a way of, of actually making this faster. Now, uh, who of you has ever heard of or has used Ccache? A few people? Okay, so Ccache is, is a, is a uh, code compiling accelerator. And the way it works is this. When you build something, there's a number of inputs. And as long as those inputs are the same, the same output should occur. So what sorts of things do we have as inputs to compiling C? So the first thing is perhaps the compiler itself, right? So we have the compiler and the, the version of that compiler. We have things like header files and other dependencies, the actual C program itself, uh, the environment variables that are there, which libraries are available and so on. So there's a number of inputs. And as long as those, those don't change, the compiler is going to take those inputs it's going to create two things. It's going to create a .o file, and it's going to create some output on standard error, right? the output of what you see when it runs. Now, what Ccache does is it sits in front of the compiler, and it says, these were the inputs that happened before, and they happen to be the same this time. So instead of running GCC, all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the .o file from here to where it should be, and I'm going to spit out standard error. And what this means is instead of GCC doing its thing, it just does a copy and a print, and that's it. Okay, it makes it very fast. Now, some people don't trust it, but I can guarantee you it's, it's identical. It's never failed me, okay? Now, maybe in your overnight builds where you don't care about speed, don't use it, but, but it makes your lives a lot faster. It means if you do a make and then a make clean and then a make again, the second one's a lot, a lot faster. Before I get there, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is how shared state cache works, but it happens at a package and a build system level. And that makes things a whole lot faster when you're building things. When you look at the output of the, the, uh, the screen there, you'll see that it says set scene. Set scene is essentially letting us know that as we go through, in fact, pardon me, it is reading information from the shared state cache and not doing it from scratch. So here it's populating the sysroot from the shared state cache. It's getting the license information, the QA settings from before, and so on. It's not redoing that work. We have a question. Cache, Try talking uh, right into the mic, sorry. Is a cache um, like inside the whatever your temp directory is dot So th there's a directory called s state cache and essentially it, li it lives in there. We haven't shown you where that is yet, but in your local.com file it, there's literally a setting that says shared state uh, you know shared state dir and you just point it to wherever you want to keep it. And you can't yeah. save it at all for some reason. Pardon me? Could we save it for some reason? Well, the reason why you'd save it is so the next time you do your build, you, uh, your build is faster. You can actually, there's a way of sharing it with some of your colleagues that's too a, to make things as well. That's what I meant. <laughs> but but there's, uh, there's some, some caveats in how that works and uh, uh, you can't both use it at the same time. But there are ways around that. But uh, anyway. All right, so we have another question over here. You go. I guess I kind of thought that make already did that. Like what that it just saw the, oh, okay. No, so what make does is it bases everything on, on timestamps. 
So if the inputs are newer than the output file, then it will rerun the step. It, it knows nothing about how it was created. So in fact, I can mess up make by clock skew. I can mess up make by basically touching a file and uh, basically making it newer than its inputs and make will never know. So make is actually fairly, fairly uh, uh, it's very simple. It uses very simple inputs. Ccache actually looks at the files themselves and makes sure nothing has changed. Sorry. Let's wait for the, the mic. I, I, it, partially because I can't hear you, partially for the recording. So running BitBake is running Ccache? Uh, so the individual things inside perhaps might use Ccache. BitBake is essentially looking at higher level steps. It's actually saying, have I done the compile before? Have I done the configure before? Instead of doing those steps uh, over again, it's Ccache at a, at a much higher level. It's not at a code level. Yeah, Ccache is used for the code level builds. Another question? Yeah. So when using make, um, sometimes I'll touch a file to force it to be built. Sure. Is there a similar mechanism with this cache? Uh, we will talk about, uh, I believe we talk about um, stamp files later on. So uh, similar, uh, similar kind of, of, of uh, reasons and similar kind of, of uh, output, yes. Uh, vastly different mechanism. But uh, uh, side effects that perhaps, oops, that uh, perhaps uh, are, are uh, a bit different. So let's look at recipes here. Uh, the next thing, of course, is looking at exactly what's in a recipe. Uh, we have a number of, of variables. And in fact, we can't go through any like anything like all the variables, but we can go through a couple here. And there's a number of, of, uh, of operators that you might want to look at later, which we probably don't have time to talk about. They're at the very end of this talk. So you can actually look at some of the very common uh, uh, operators that are there and how they all work. I'll point how some of them point out how some of them work as we go through some of the examples. Uh, but the first one is that we're looking at that's in your recipe is your source underscore URI. This is where your source code comes from. And in fact, it's a list of not only source code, but also modifications to your source code. So it will be a list of your perhaps tarball or git repository. And then based on the name of the other files you add, if you add things that end in .patch, they're considered patch files and they're added at the patch st stage. If you add, depending what you're building, uh, configuration files or, um, uh, or other specially named files, in fact, the fetcher will actually pass it on to the appropriate bit. So uh, it's used for configuration or for, uh, like I said, patching or what have you. So source URI is where all of our source inputs come from. Okay. We also have depends and R depends. Uh, dependencies are effectively things that we have uh, at build time, so they're build time dependencies. R depends or anything that starts with an R are runtime dependencies. So a build time dependency means it needs to be built before us. Okay, it needs to build because part of its output is used for building us. An R depend, on the other hand, is something where we need it on the target in order to execute. So an R depends doesn't imply a build order, but it implies that the thing that we were we need needs to be on the image where, when we finally run. Okay. Next, you'll see we have uh, extra extra OE conf, extra OE make. When it comes to making changes to the configuration and build system, we don't want to have to rewrite tasks when all we want to change is the options that are passed into dot slash configure, for instance, or the options we're passing to make. And so these variables are essentially used by the pre-existing tasks so that. You don't have to change the task. You can just provide an input to the task instead. And again, it provides a dry way of doing it. We also have specially named variables that start with the word files. This lets us know which files go into which packages. And uh, we actually use a, a conditional after this, the underscore name. We have to provide the name of the package we want those files to go into. And again, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you have to get in, we have to talk about how variables work in order to make that happen. Uh, but for the sake of uh, time, what we're going to do instead is we're going to go through some examples here just to show you how some of these things work. Uh, so this is, in fact, a, uh, a recipe, uh, in this case, for, uh, let's see now here, this one's ETH tool. And so essentially, we're going to be looking at how this works. Now, this is in a canonical, canonical order that you're supposed to put things into. Uh, this is a, a relatively straightforward recipe. Uh, we can see it's relatively straightforward because it's auto-tooled, and so a lot of what you need for building these things is uh, straightforward. At the top, you'll, have, you'll see what we have is uh, something called descriptive metadata. In other words, it tells you what it is, uh, you know, where we got it from, which web page, who the author is, 
uh, the section it comes from and so, that, where it's going to be stored in, the, in the, the, the tree and so on. So these things are all just informational largely. They mostly don't influence how things are built. Next you see we have license and license checksum file. The license itself needs to be one of the, the recognized licenses that's already could be configured into Open Embedded. But in this case, we can see because we're humans that it is, in fact, the GPL v2 plus license. Okay, that just makes it easier for us to understand what it is uh, instead of parsing what the file is, uh, what the license is from the file. Now, having said that, we have, uh, we have uh, a newer system coming on as, as part of the SPDX project where we actually have a license scanner that will figure out licenses for us. But right now, as recipe developers, uh, it's up to you to go in, read the license, and then put the appropriate license in that, in that variable. And in fact, if there's more than one license, it's space delimited, as most lists in Open Embedded are, in fact, uh, space delimited. Notice we, we, have, a, we have two uh, MD5 sums provided here. Uh, in this case, we provide a URI to the actual thing where the license is, and then we provide an MD5 sum of what that license text is. This isn't there to prevent people from making changes. This is so that we notice that a change has been made. So let's say upstream changed the license, that MD5 sum would change, and then our build would break. We would have to then go in again, read the license, make sure it still, in fact, is valid, and do the appropriate thing. Many projects have the word copying or copyright or uh, copying dot, you know, the, the name of the license at the end. You need to provide each one of those files and their MD5 sums so you can catch licensing changes. Notice that the license could also be in a C file. In this case, you need to provide the beginning and the ending line of that license, otherwise it will actually MD5 sum all of your code as well. And that's going to change, all right? So MD5 sum isn't perfect, right? It, it's, people have found uh, equivalents or, or, or collisions in MD5, but in this particular case, we're just looking for changes. Uh, it's very unlikely that somebody would actually change the license to make sure there was a collision. That's, that's kind of crazy. So we're just trying to, to catch small problems in this case, all right? This, this isn't a getting things from a third party. This is inside the source code you've already received. The next thing here is the source URI, where we're getting our source from. You'll see that we are getting it from, in this case, a kernel.org mirror. Uh, there are so many people using Open Embedded that, in fact, a number of websites and, and sources of source code have actually asked the Open Embedded project to provide a mirroring system. So things like the GNU project, kernel.org, and others have these aliases. And so this will actually use round robin DNS to have you get source code from a, a specific place uh, so that not everybody's pulling from the same thing. This was a major issue because a lot of people run auto builders overnight. And so you'd have all the auto builders pulling source code at the same time, which is sometimes a problem. Okay, so here you'll see, otherwise there's the path. Uh, you'll see that we've actually put the, the package version in here as a, as, a, uh, as a variable. Now, the reason why this is interesting is because the version is read by default out of the file name. So you'll notice we haven't provided it anywhere. It's by saying eth tool underscore 3.15, it knows that the version we're building is 3.15. So that will be filled in there. So again, we don't want to repeat ourselves, right? And so we just put it in the variable. And you'll notice it just uses regular sort of shell style variables to make things easier. However, you'll see we have a few other things. Notice that it's all in a giant space limited string. So we have to do backslash at the end, which you're escaping the end of line character. There can't be anything after that. So this effectively is often referred to as the continuation character. It means that we have four things in this space delimited list. Uh, the next thing is run p-test. This is a, uh, a set of packaging tests that you could add if you wanted to. In this case, they have. Uh, there's a patch here for avoiding parallel tests, which will actually patch. I believe it patches the make file. And then down here, we have another patch that gets added, uh, in this case, uh, for presumably an unsigned int issue of some sort. But this will have a couple of patches added to the source code before, uh, before it's configured and built. Now, this is a tar file from a third party. All right, now there's a couple of issues with that. The first one is, is that the file might be changed by uh, you know, a hacker or something at the, th at, the other, at the other end. So it might have been subverted. We might have a situation where, uh, because we're reading it down through potentially HTTP, somebody may have changed it en route. Right? We may have a man-in-the-middle attack, as they're called. 
Uh, that's, that's a problem. And the other issue is we, we might have just had data corruption. Maybe there was maybe there's bad memory in one of the switches or something uh, between us and them. So there's a number of situations where things can fail when you're transferring a file like this. So we need to catch all these potential problems. And so one of the ways is by providing an MD5 sum and a SHA-256 sum of the actual file itself. Now originally it was just an MD5 sum, and in fact we could put it at the end of the file here. File name rather. Uh, col uh, semicolon MD5 sum equals like before, like up here. But the problem with MD5 sums is, of course, we found collisions, right? People have, have broken MD5 sum. And so as a result, it is not sufficient to use it anymore, which is why we're now using SHA-256 sums. But I'm sure everyone's thinking, why are we using both then? What's the point, right? The rea well, the, it's, it's a belt and suspenders situation. Uh, eventually, people are going to figure out collisions for this one presumably. By providing two, first of all, it's not that hard to provide two, but providing two, all of a sudden you make it very difficult now to find a collision that works in both. Okay, so in fact, we are still making it better by doing this appropriately. It also means your recipe can potentially be used in older versions of Yocto Project where they don't support SHA-256. Okay, so the next thing, of course, is we have our inherits. In this case, you'll see we're inheriting from AutoTools and P-Test. Why? Because it's built with auto tools and p-test is something we want to run. Again, packaging test. And then down here we have a change to the, uh, the runtime dependencies. In this case, we are saying in the event of doing a p-test for this package name, we need make on the target. So we're doing a plus equals uh, make. It means that a cross version of make will be built and we'll put on the target so we can do our p-testing on target. Okay, how do I know it's a target version of the package? Because it doesn't end in dash native. Okay, if you ever see dash native, that's a package intended for your build machine. It's native to the machine that you're on. Okay? So that is an example of perhaps a, a fairly simple recipe. Realistically, we provided source code, some patches. We've said it's an auto tool package, and then we've basically provided MD5 sums to make sure we've got an integrity, uh, that we've got good integrity. Okay, here we go. Another question. Are depends used in practice? Is it used at package deployment time? How is it used? It's only used when we when we create the image file, and so when we create the image, we're going to put eth tool on the thing, and it needs in the case of ptest, it needs to have make installed as well. So it means that uh, make will end up on the image in the in the event of ptest being included overall on the image. So it's used at image creation time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, another question. Where are the variables like PV and PN and kernel or so stored? PV comes from the um, from the, 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 the file name. This is the name of, of this recipe. Mm -hmm. And by default, the thing before the under, first underscore is your package name. The thing after the first underscore is your is your version. Oh, okay. So again, we don't want to repeat ourselves. Again, we're pulling things out of what we already have. That's a good question, though. In our courses, our longer courses, we tend to go through this in a lot more detail. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have a lot of time to go through everything. So, one second, hold on. Oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, sorry, I'll keep this short. Uh, the source URI MD5 sum and SHA-256 sum are for all of the uh, all of the packages? Just, just the first thing. Oh, just the first thing. Okay. okay. So you want to provide them for other things? There's a way of actually providing. These are called uh, attributes. You can actually provide attributes for other things other than the source, the first thing. But the first thing in the source URI is always your source code, again, by convention. And therefore, these attributes apply uh, 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 by convention to the source okay. tarball. OK. And uh, what about the other files in the source URI, the eat tool you and patch? These are, these are all local files to okay. the recipe. And so we know they're OK because we provided them. And the auto tools and ptest, are these other recipes? These are BB, BB classes. So, okay. so we are inheriting from them as if they are, as if they are, um, Thank you. you're welcome. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, just for time reasons, obviously we're, we're skipping a few details, so very good questions. So uh, recipes are used for all sorts of things, and in fact, almost everything we do uh, is bit bake something. Of course, as a result, we are always triggering a recipe to, uh, to be built. And so, of course, it can be anything from bootloaders, kernels, uh, host compilers, uh, images, uh, applications, interpreters, test libraries, whatever you want. It's ultimately all built from source code. 
Uh, there are some dependencies on your local uh, distro that you're using. Uh, those distros, those uh, dependencies are relatively small. Uh, the reason why we need those is to bootstrap the actual versions we use to build things. Okay, and Yocto Project is working very close, or, or, or uh, working very closely with the people that are trying to do reproducible builds, such to the point that uh, in the future we should be able to build a bit for bit uh, identical uh, Yocto image uh, from two different people. Right now we have issues with things like timestamps and such being slightly different, even if you build it today and tomorrow. But with the reproducible builds, in fact, we should be able to build identical packages today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, which is important. Okay, so let's also look at a different example. Here's BC. BC is a, uh, an arbitrary precision uh, calculator that can be used. Uh, in this particular case, you'll see that it's actually in Pocky Meta, which is the uh, uh, open embedded meta, uh, sorry, open embedded core or OE core directory. Uh, recipes extended in this case is telling us uh, these, this is a recipe that's not strictly core to what we need. It's a, an extra package that provides other uh, capabilities under the BC package directory. There is the recipe name, right? So it's BC, in this case, version 1.06 that we're building. Uh, and you'll notice in this case, we have some dependencies on various things. Again, a bit hard to read because this becomes very large, but we have our descriptive metadata at the top. Here's our licensing da data. Notice we're, we're including all the different recipe, uh, for, rather files where we have different uh, licenses. Notice we have two licenses listed up here. You'll see that in this case, we have some information surrounding the, the repository. Uh, section base uh, means that it's going to, it's going to go into the base directory. This is only really valid if you're using Debian packaging for uh, your repository. We also have a dependency, in this case, flex. So we need to have flex built. Uh, here you see, we, you'll see we have our source URI. In this case, we're pulling BC down from the GNU mirror, and we're, uh, we're using a local patch to change it. Again, we have our MD5 sums. And then here you'll see we're, we're inheriting from auto tools, tech info, update alternatives. In the case of auto tools, of course, this uses dot slash configure and so on. In the case of uh, tech info, it means that in fact, it has an info help page. So it's like a man page, but it's the info page instead. And then update alternatives. The idea here is that quite often multiple tools provide the same functionality. So update alternatives allows us to provide more than one tool and only have one linked to the default name. And it turns out if we look a little bit further down here, we have an alternative uh, possibility, which is DC. All right, so DC is the base or the, the older version of this kind of package. BC is an augmented version. And so this is basically saying, make a symbolic link from DC to BC uh, and do it with an alternative priority of 100. So by each alternative version of a particular utility being made available, we choose the highest priority to actually provide that specific utility. So if we installed DC, it would actually have a higher, typically a higher priority to make sure it overrode other things. Uh, what else do we have? Oh yes, base class extend. You'll see it says equals native. Okay, it's not a plus equals. We are in fact overriding what the BB class extend is. By setting it to native, it means in this case that uh, we will get a, a native version of this package as opposed to a target version. Uh, let's also look at uh, building on top of a BB class. In this particular case, of course, we are talking about auto tools. Uh, by including auto tools, we don't have to provide any of any custom tasks. Everything is already there. It knows after the patch step, it's going to automatically run dot slash configure. It's going to automatically run dot, uh, um, it's automatically going to run make rather and then make install. It, there, there is a contract with the developer when you use auto tools as to how to build it and it is taking advantage of that contract. All right. Uh, let's look at another one called FLAC. FLAC is a uh, lossless audio format. And uh, what this essentially does is it allows us to see a moderately more complicated recipe. Uh, in this particular case, we're gonna look at some tuning features that are being passed in through OEConf, some of the packaging direct uh, metadata, and so on and so forth. So again, hard to read. Again, if you can't see this from where you're sitting, look at the, the slides online. Again, we have our descriptive metadata up here. We have our licenses. Again, quite a few places where the licenses is kept. You'll see that it has a lot of licenses, right? GFDL, GPL, V2, LGPL, V2.1, BSD. Uh, and then down he here, it has uh, a build dependency. So to build FLAC, we need to have libaug built first. Aug is one of the 
audio codecs, right? So we have to build that before we build this. You'll see here we get our source code from, right? So our source code comes from downloads.zif.org. Again, our source URI, uh, MD5 sum and SHA-256 sum. Uh, at the top here, we have the name that the CVE product, in this case, this ties into the security system. It says that uh, although we were building FLAC, when it comes to looking up uh, security issues, we, we're going to use the name libflac instead. Because normally the, the, the names are the same. In this case, they're different. Uh, you'll see it inherits from AutoTools and Getext. Getext means it actually has internationalization, localization support. In other words, you can change the language of its output very straightforwardly. Extra OE conf. In this case, instead of changing the configuration step, we can inject configuration into the OE uh, configuration step by setting this variable. These will be passed to dot slash configure. All right. We also have uh, another one down here, extra OE conf. So that's an equals. Here we do a plus equals. This means that these extra steps will also be added to OE conf. Uh, and the interesting thing here is we have essentially uh, Python code within the variable. So whenever you see dollar open brace, usually it's a variable. By putting an at symbol after that, what you're including instead is executable Python code. And so in this case, what it's doing is it is actually using some Python code that lo is looking at another variable called tune features. Tune features is something that's provided by the machine, and it allows you to tell your build what sort of extra capabilities you have hardware-wise. In this case, it's saying if I have an Altivec, and an Altivec is a vector processor that's used on uh, PowerPC. If I have an Altivec, I want to enable Altivec in my build. However, if I don't, I want to disable Altivec because it doesn't make any sense to use an Altivec if it isn't there. Okay. However, uh, we also have another one here. It says tune features if it's Core 2, right? Core 2 Duo means we're on x86. It means we want to enable SSE. We want to enable the vector processor. Uh, in the case of uh, it being a Core i7, right? Same deal. We want to turn on SSE support because it'll be faster, right? We have essentially special hand-coded routines that use the vector processor in order to do encoding to make things faster if we have access to that, that kind of hardware. So through the tuning features, we can communicate with our recipe to turn on certain things else in the configuration uh, step. Next, you'll see we have a series of packages. So by default, the package list is fairly, fairly uh, small. Uh, it, it, uh, for, in the case of FLAC, it would actually, by default, create a, a FLAC dev, FLAC doc, FLAC, FLAC packages. But we have some other names we want to create. And you'll see here we're doing a plus equals, which means there's a space delimited addition to that list. Lib FLAC, lib FLAC plus, lib aug FLAC, lib aug FLAC plus plus. So those are four extra packages that are being built beyond the normal list. And you'll see here down the side that we provide files underscore and then the name of the different packages. What essentially this is allowing us to do is it is allowing us to provide a version of this variable based on which package it is we were building. Okay, so if at the time we we're building libflac, the files variable is going to be set to that, which effectively is libflac.so, and that's it. That's what goes into the package. All right. So by providing these different versions of one uh, one uh, variable, it means that we don't have to say if building this, then do that. It's a very straightforward, very fast, very dry way of saying these are the files I want to go into these packages. You'll see this technique is used for a lot of things. This is not the same thing. Okay, this is not a conditional. That is the variable name right there. Okay, we know this because these are all in caps. Everything after an underscore that is lowercase is typically a modifier of some sort. In this case, it is. Okay, we have a question at the back. Here it is. There you go. What is the D after the you contains? After the contains. So, you know, the VBUtil contains. I, um, there's tune features, then there's what you're looking for. There's true, there's false, and there's a comma D. Over there? Oh, yeah. um, I, uh, I actually don't remember. All right. Yeah. I'd have to go look it up. All right. That's the thing. We, that we, uh, we can't know it all. Yeah. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it's a it's a global variable, and uh, I think it's the data variable, but I, I'm not actually sure. Yeah, the the, the BB at the beginning is the global bit bake um, uh, object, so it's the bit bake instance. I believe D is data, but I don't remember exactly. 
Uh, quite honestly, unless you write these all the time, you tend to find when you copy it and change it appropriately. So I, uh, I very much doubt that somebody knows everything in this system, except perhaps Richard Purdy, who's the, who's the uh, system architect and the major, one of the major authors for this. Yeah. The, um, the Python code that's running in each one of those, is that spun up in a new instance of the Python interpreter, or is that, is that in the context of the, um, the rest of the build system? Uh, you'll find that new threads are, are uh, kicked off, but no, it's, it's a single instance otherwise. So that BB object, for example, that's the same. That's the same object throughout all, uh, throughout all those uh, little script. I, I'd have to look at the details, but but in general, I would say yes. But a lot of things are passed by copy, so it, it's hard to know exactly whether that's true. But I, I suspect tr that is true. Okay. Yeah. Uh, certainly, every time we start a new recipe, uh, there is um, you have you effectively have uh, your own version of that. So it's always BB plus what's relevant to your recipe. So, and uh, I don't believe it's, an, it's certainly not a new forked process, but there, there is a layered data model, certainly. It's augmented as you go into a recipe. So uh, when it comes to grouping metadata, of course, we've got our include and our require. I actually covered this before. Uh, essentially, when you include a file, it looks for it in the search path. If it doesn't find it, it's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, in the case of a require, on the other hand, if it's not there, that's an error. So again, if you absolutely require the file to be installed or uh, included, use this one. If it's, if it's a, uh, an optional thing, you use the include. Uh, here's another one called a phono. Uh, in fact, uh, this one really is only showing us one thing, and that is you can change uh, a task. This is all fairly straightforward. We've seen this before. Here you see we have a, a require, right? This require is, is pulling in common information. Otherwise, we have our source URI. We have, uh, down here you can see a C flags. In this case, we are actually taking the C flags variable used in order to build libc uc libc, and we are appending it, we're appending this value for uc libc to this C flags variable. So again, we don't have to say if lib uc libc do this. By doing this, by using this is in fact an, uh, an extended operator. By doing an underscore append underscore libc uc libc, this means that in the case of this override being set, we're appending to this, this value. We didn't actually strictly cover appends. Again, it's in the appendix of this slide deck. All right, so the big thing here is in the actual include file uh, that I want to show you is, because most of the rest is the same and we've already seen it, uh, the big thing is here. You'll see we have a do, un un um, do underscore install append. This means we are actually going to append this code to the end of the existing do install. So whenever you see an underscore append or underscore prepend, it does exactly what it says. All right, that is not a part of the actual task itself. So for instance, don't make a do underscore append. That would, that would be bad. <laughs> okay, uh, but do install append. And so this will be added to whatever is already there. Again, notice you can change anything. All right, you can extend anything, you can add anything and so on. So, it's rather an awful lot to, to cover, and I apologize we haven't stopped for a bio break, but we only really have another 30 minutes. So, uh, should I keep going, or do people want to take a bit of a break before we get on to this next section? A break? Okay, let's do a quick break. Um, can we do five minutes? Cool. Five minute break back in, uh, back at 22. Okay. So when things go wrong, let's, uh, let's talk about when things go wrong. And things go wrong a lot. I mean, we can't really help that. Um, in fact, in my demo, it went wrong. And that's the problem with demos, unless they're completely pre-canned. Uh, some, uh, some of the other Yocto developers that um, have perhaps thought their things out a bit better uh, in the past have actually uh, recorded a successful run and then played it on screen. And it's a far better way of doing it than, than what I did. Uh, and the great thing about that, of course, is you can speed up the boring parts. So uh, it's actually quite a, a great way of doing things and something I still need to, to, to learn how to do myself. Uh, but the very first thing is, of course, is uh, you want to look at the actual environment itself and see what's wrong. Now, there's two major kinds of errors that you get when it comes to recipes. Uh, the first kind of error that you get is uh, what I call a parse error. All right? In the case of a parse error, it means that Python does not understand what you wrote. Right? You actually literally get problems in your code that it's not understood. 
Uh, without fixing a parse error, you cannot move on. All right, if Python can't understand your code, your code is basically un not helpful. You can't do anything. So you have to first fix that problem. And it often helps being somebody who knows Python in order to fix that issue. Okay, the next kind of error is of course a logic error. And this is a situation where your code is, is perfectly understandable to Python, uh, but it's just wrong. Okay, and so you've, you've put the wrong thing into the wrong variable, or you haven't provided a variable, or your, your, your dynamic Python code that figures out the value of the thing you're looking for is in the wrong format, something like that. So it's valid Python code, it's just incorrect. And the, the way to look at this is you actually can actually look at uh, the, the output of what you've done and, uh, and get those values. So for instance, in the case of a logic error, there's a number of different variables that you perhaps will have set or that are automatically set default-wise. And um, if you want to see what they're, what they're set to, uh, you know what you've actually written in to your recipe, but how do you know what the actual value is? You know, where is your work there? Now, those of us who've been doing it for a while know where it should be, but perhaps there's a mistake somewhere. So one of the ways you can do is you can use the minus minus environment or minus E on a recipe, and it will dump out all of your metadata. Now, when I say all of your metadata, I mean everything. Okay, every variable you've set, every task you've, you've put in there, all of the Python code that does all the bits and pieces. If you do this, it's gonna be reams and re like pages and pages and pages of output. So if you grep for things or you put it into less and search, you will find what you're looking for. So in the case of BitBake, let's say we wanna see the output of uh, your kernel uh, metadata. So we do minus E virtual kernel to pull out the abstract kernel class that we're looking for and grep for things that start with capital S equals we will get the source directory, in other words, where the source lives for the kernel. Okay, in this case, we would get something that looked like this. Now, it wouldn't say $home, it would be your actual home directory, but uh, as I've said it in the past, there's no point in having my home directory up there, it's gonna be yours. Uh, what if you wanna see what, what file is used as far as packaging is concerned? You can, again, grep for uh, you know, the, the, uh, the hat or circumflex or whatever you wanna call that char character indicates the start of a line. It's, a part of a, a uh, regular expression. Anything that starts with file equals, right, it will dump that out so you can see what that's set to and so on. Let's say you wanna see the, uh, the, the, the PF version. Now PF is an amalgamation of uh, three things. It's your uh, package name, your package version, and your package release. And you'll see here we have netbase dash one, point, uh, one underscore five, but, uh, uh, pardon me, netbase dash one is the, is the package name rather, underscore 5.3, 5.3 is the version. Da, uh, and then R0 is the, is the, uh, the revision. Uh, so that's, that's the deal. What if you want to see the, 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 uh, the build directory? Well, in this case, you look for B equals. Now, we're not telling you what all the different variables mean other than what I just said, but there's a whole list of variables that mean all sorts of things. Your source and your build directory may be different. You may be building out of tree. In this case, you can see this is the build directory for the, the kernel source code, and you'll see that we have the version in there, and then we have a, uh, a git auto increment uh, and, and a, a, um, a commit that actually shows us where we are in the, in the build tree. The good thing about this is, again, we can get back to the exact code we used to make this work. Okay, uh, Packages, we can see which packages are being provided and built uh, and so on. The other thing is, of course, is that we need to see the output of what we're doing and, and building. And uh, we do this under what's called the temp directory. Now, in perfect form, there's, there are two temp directories. There's the TMP directory and there's the TEMP directory. Okay, so I don't know who to blame for this, but ultimately there are a number of name clashes like this. The TMP directory or tempdir variable points to the tempdir inside your build directory. So if you open your build directory, you'll see there's a TMP directory. Everything under there are derived files from your build. However, if you go into your work directory, your work directory is TMP work slash, and then your machine type, the name of your recipe. Once you're under there, there's a TEMP directory, and this is where your logs live. And I've yet to figure out why it's called temp and not log, log or logs. I'm pointing at somebody at the back of the room that might know, uh, because that's where all your log files live, right? I think every other temp file has been moved elsewhere over the years. Uh, but if you go under the TEMP directory or T directory, because that's the variable name is T equals, uh, you will find all of your log files. And so if you, uh, if you look under there, you will find your individual log files. Now, in fact, I am talking to the wrong slide. This slide is actually talking about your cooker log. 
But if you go under TMP log cooker machine, you will see all the different steps you took. Notice that you have each one of the tasks that are running because we have a different, uh, each thread will go through a series of tasks. Each thread will in fact go into the working dir, in fact use that temp directory I just told you about. Here's an example of one for hello, which is a hello world program. And again, we specify it this way in our, in our metadata, but that's what it expands out to. Uh, what it means is we end up getting a series of log files. This is what I was talking about. Uh, you'll see we have a series of log files and a series of run files. Let's go back to the log files. The log files are the output of each one of your steps. The run files are the actual code that was run in order to run the, the, uh, the task. So when you run do compile, there's a series of shell script commands that run. They go into the appropriate run do compile file. Okay. However, the output of that gets captured in the log do underscore compile file here. Now, what we've done is we've simplified it. You'll find in yours, there's, there's actually a dot and then a number after each one of these files and then a symbolic link to the most recent one. The reason is, is because every time we do a new build, it, it puts the, the, the PID, in other words, the process ID at the end of each one of the, the files. The reason is, is because over time, you don't want to uh, rub out the old log file you had from before. But you want to know what the most recent one is because the PIDs wrap. So eventually, you're going to have PIDs that are lower than the ones you had from before. Okay? But it means over time, your log files get very big. Okay? You get more and more and more of them over time. So your build directory will get bigger and bigger over time. And indeed, every time you increase your revision or change the version of your software, a new working directory will be created. So don't reuse build directories, first of all. So every new project means a new build directory. It also means if you're working over a project for a very long period of time, don't delete your shared state, don't delete your configuration, but every once in a while, it's probably a good idea to delete and recreate your temp directory. You'll, you'll regain a lot of space. Just remember, you'll, you'll lose your development history, but if you don't care about that, it's all good. So layers. Layers, of course, are the killer feature that uh, allow you to bring everything in appropriate. The great thing about layers is you can stratify your changes, and again, through BB appends files and maybe your own BB classes and, and ink files and so on, you can actually change what's happening at a lower layer by providing your own version of things higher up. Now, this is what the sort of layer cake uh, thing sort of should look like. You'll see at the bottom we have our meta directory, which is uh, the uh, OE core directory. We have our uh, distribution layer, in this case, Metapocky. Uh, maybe we have our BSP for our, our, uh, our hardware. And then maybe we have a GUI, or maybe we have a, like a commercial layer from a, a vendor. Maybe we have our own developer layers. That's the generic, straight out of the textbook example of how this works. How is it going to work for you? Well, let me give you perhaps an extreme example. However, it's one that is used at, at real companies. And that is, you're always going to have Meta at the bottom. You're always going to have a distro layer that's probably specific to you as the next level up. You're always going to have a BSP, probably the next level up from that. So the bottom three layers, very similar. However, above that, uh, I mean, you might have your UI layer still. I don't know. It depends on what you're building. But above that, you quite often will have uh, perhaps your meta Pocky layer will be meta the name of your company. Let's say meta Acme in good old Roadrunner and, and Wiley Coyote uh, style. Okay, so meta Acme. Uh, Perhaps then within that, there's a product group of, of some sort or a division, right? So meta and then the name of your division. Maybe then you've got a product group, right? Meta, name of the product group. Then you've got a product, meta product. Then you have a, then you have a development group, meta, name of the group. Then you have your own layer, right? So you may have a dozen layers with all the different stuff in it. Now, this seems extreme, but the whole idea with layers is if you own your layer, right? You've got Meta Bob, right? If your name is Bob, uh, you can do whatever you want to in that layer, right? But as things work and and uh, they do their thing, you would then take that recipe and you would add it to the layer below that. Maybe you add it to your groups layer, right? Once that's that's working well and you're all happy, maybe that goes into the product layer. Maybe that goes into the product group layer. Maybe that goes into your division layer and so on. But by doing this, you have a very very strong way of reusing code across multiple lines of business, multiple divisions, and so on and so forth. And if it's generic enough code, maybe it gets all the way down through to meta, right? Maybe you submit it upstream to 
the open embedded projects. And maybe it then gets into Yocto uh, proper so that you don't have to maintain that code anymore yourself and other people can benefit from it. The thing to remember is what's actual IP and what isn't, right? If it's something specific to how you make money, in other words, it's something that you do and nobody else, great, IP. But if you're dealing with something that's literally everybody's doing, upstream it, right? Why? It's boring. It doesn't do anything that actually generates you money. It gets in the way. It costs you money to maintain it, right? If you put it upstream, it means others can help you. It means that it's probably solving problems for other people as well. So you want to promote your, your recipes to go down as far as you can in that layer cake where, where possible and where it makes sense, okay? Now, uh, the big thing here is, uh, more than anything else, is what's written in orange. Do not edit files directly in the Pocky source tree. I was at a, teaching a course at one point where I was describing things to my class of, of uh, students, and uh, I had two supposed Yocto experts sitting in the back row. And when we got to talking about this, all of a sudden they stopped paying attention and were madly typing at the back of the class. Turns out later they had edited the Pocky tree directly. <laughs> Didn't really understand how layers had worked. So uh, this happens sometimes, okay? you can do better, you now know, you provide your changes in layers, okay? Don't do things directly. Turns out that Yocto is pretty hard to learn on your own, and the sort of obvious way is quite often the wrong way of doing things. And until you learn the convention, it, it takes a little bit of, of uh, doing. It's that steep initial learning curve that's a bit of an issue. There's also a number of uh, layers you can find in the layers.openembedded.org. We don't have time to show you it, but it's a nice little Django site, it has a nice search uh, depending what you're looking for, it'll show you which uh, layer provides which recipe or BSP for whatever you're dealing with. You'll find that a lot of our tools, including things like Toaster, are tied into the, the openembedded.org layer index, and it means we have a centralized place uh, to keep all of this extra metadata that allows us to do our thing. And in fact, the cool thing about this is you can run your own layer index within your own company, uh, also caching this information uh, and actually uh, run these things internally with your own code without having to publish them on the internet as well. It's, it's, very, it's actually very powerful. This is used very heavily at Wind River, uh, which is where it was developed. So uh, concept of layers, uh, you were showing earlier where you would use a BB appends uh, within, a, within an existing file to, append, oh, I see. To, to modify something. In the concept of layers, is that not needed? Is it automatically superseded if your layer is above? Yeah, so in other words, if I provide a new BB file, uh, would that override one in a lower layer? And the answer is yes. The problem with that now is you are now the maintainer of a file that somebody else has already written. So the reason why you'd want to use a BB append file is because typically you only want to change one or two things. So if you want more work, absolutely <laughs> uh, overwrite what's there. But the whole idea with this is not to have more work, is to have less work. And so literally, if there's a single thing you need to change, you just write a BB appends, it overrides that one thing, and away you go. Less work, right? The, the great thing about Yocto Project is it's a force multiplier when it comes to engineers. It's always harder to, 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 uh, to hire new engineers than it is to save an engineer, right? If you can save engineering time, you don't have to fight to get a new seat. And certainly doing work that everybody else is doing already is a waste of your time. You should be writing code that ultimately leads to value. There's too many of us that are, that are considered overhead in the engineering world, okay? So try to share that as much as you can. Try to work on things that ultimately uh, have direct value to your company. Board support packages. We're running perilously out of time, unfortunately. Um, but uh, board support packages are there specifically for boards. And so the idea here is that you pull in things like the architecture, the bootloader, the kernel, uh, the graphics driver, and other things like that. Uh, any extra patches you might need or, or uh, extra bits and pieces. So they can be relatively simple, uh, but they're go they they are much smaller than a traditional BSP you have in the commercial world, okay? It doesn't, it, it doesn't tend to include, for instance, things like your compiler and so on. We get that from the base, okay? Uh, images we're actually gonna cover this afternoon. So that's actually probably a perfect place to stop. Um, if you go to the end of this talk, Actually, you know what, there's only a couple of, of pages. We'll just, in, we'll just introduce images here quickly, actually. Uh, so an image in this case is a specific versions of packages made into a, uh, a root file system and optionally into a, a, a binary image that then can be flashed directly to your, 
to your flash device, be it uh, SD card or EMMC or what have you. Of course, uh, you need a bootloader and a kernel, you need a device tree, you need certain libraries, you need certain you know, base OS kinds of things, uh, your application, uh, the kinds of things you need to make your device do the thing that you're, you're selling it to do. Okay, so you have to describe all those things in your image. The way you do that is you provide a recipe that, that typically uh, either includes an existing image, which you then modify through overriding certain variables or appending to them, uh, but you can also specify your own image install list, in other words, specify which packages you want or package groups, and then inherit from the image class in order to build an appropriate image. Uh, so here's an example of an image recipe. So you'll see it still lives under a particular um, uh, layer. In this particular case, it's, uh, in fact, it's, it's Meta Yocto uh, uh, Project Dev Day. It's YPDD. It's something we're doing tomorrow. You'll see here we've got our descriptive metadata. We've got our image install pulling in a specific package group, in this case, package group core boot, uh, basically the bare minimum to boot your machine. Here we're also adding pSplash and drop bear. This will, in fact, add a splash screen to the boot up sequence. You'll see we are inheriting core image. Okay, which is a BB class that, that uh, describes how to build the image. And then we're specifying how big we want the root file system to, to be. And this is because uh, presumably the, the machine type that we've done specifies that we want the root file system to be built as a, an ext2 uh, or 4 file system and, or perhaps a, uh, a binary um, a flash image. Okay, so here we're saying we want our root Im image to be, in this case, 8, uh, eight, um, eight megs, if I remember correctly. Uh, question mark equals, so again, we didn't go through operators. Question mark equals is a uh, default uh, assignment. In other words, if it hasn't prior to this been in installed, it will, or uh, assigned rather, it, it will assign it that value. Uh, plus equals is an append. Okay, the make files use the same, the same operators. Okay, now there is a lab we've provided you that you can follow. Um, we're going to have to get you to this on your own time because I believe we just run out of time. But, uh, We've provided a lot of different information here on how to do things. Uh, we've also provided a bit of an addendum at the very, very end. Uh, there's all sorts of extra information here. Uh, but do have fun and thank you for, for, for being with us. Immediately after this, we have a BitBake reference that gets into operators and other things like that. Okay, but for the moment, are there any final questions before we break for, uh, for lunch? Yes, uh, what happened to the, ah, thank you. I mean, kind of an obvious place to leave it. <laughs> Thank you. Has anyone ever got this, got Yocto to build Android? <laughs> okay, that is not, I, I am laughing not because that's a funny question, uh, but because that is a very common question. And uh, I am aware of uh, at least two, possibly three groups of people that have tried to do this. Uh, the reason being that, of course, those of you who have tried to build Android will know that the build system for Android is pretty horrific. It's a series of very fragile make files, and uh, this is a much less fragile system. So people have tried. Unfortunately, the, the problem with, with AOSP is it is based on an internal uh, Google uh, code base, and the problem is, is that they don't easily take patches from outside, and they certainly don't care about being built under Yocto project. So anything that you do, essentially, you're going to have to do every time there's a code drop from Google. So unless you can change this internally at Google, in other words, get hired and advocate and change their whole system. Unfortunately, uh, AOSP and, and Android is, is a semi-closed, semi it's, it's open source once they've released it, but until then it's essentially a semi-closed system that you cannot see. So any work in that area is, has always been lost the next time a new version comes out. And they're pretty notorious for breaking things. Sadly, yes. Which I can understand, they're trying to build a phone for their ecosystem. That, that's, that's why it's there. So. It's not a traditional open source project, basically. It's very excellent, but it's, it's, it doesn't, it has certain issues and that's one of them. So yeah, it, it, would, it would be very cool if you could. And there's a lot of people who would like it this way, but it, it doesn't solve any Google problems, unfortunately. Oh, another question? Let's try to do this without. Yeah. It's not about uh, Yocto, actually. Um, on this board, are there, is there any way to use uh, JTAG to? Is there any way to use JTAG? I am not aware of a JTAG interface on this specific board, do you know? Oh, okay. Hold on. So, the, 
Yeah, the, the there is JTAG on the bottom. Okay, the Pocket Beagle has has pads on the bottom for JTAG, so you can actually hook it up. Okay, it sure. I see that now. Custom soldering and is kind of difficult. Yeah, yeah. I, I know the so, most so of the Beagle bones do. You have, to, you have to use an XDS de, uh, debugger from from Texas Instruments um, in order to act, actually interface with it. So there's an XDS 110 or an XDS 100 or a 200, depending on what you have. It's it's. They're 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 fifty to one hundred bucks. It's they're they're not they're okay. not terrible in terms of, of cost. But in order to do the JTAG interface with Code Composer Studio, you need the XDS uh, JTAG debugger in order to be able to do that. And then unfortunately, uh, that that's just a, some pads on the bottom of the board. That's not fun. Um, and so you have, you do have to custom solder. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to break for lunch. Um, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, we are going to come back and do build route after lunch. Uh, again, after the build route, before the final talk of the day, we are going to play a game to give away this Yocto uh, book. Certainly, if you want to come and take a peek at it, uh, feel free. But uh, uh, come back after lunch, build route, and then the final Yocto uh, thing before we go to the closing game. But thank you very much.